All right. Well, you're listening to the Lament of Hope blog and podcast, and I'm here today with Deb Beachy, but I call her Moxie. Um, Moxie is a dear friend of mine. We actually met a couple years ago at a coffee shop uh, based on how we liked each other's curly hair, which is such a good memory. So now here we are a few years later, and we've walked through some hardships, some happy things together, which is awesome. Um, Deb actually left the Mennonite community several years ago. And she has also walked the entire Appalachian Trail. She's quite an adventure. If you ask her, she's got tons of stories because she's been everywhere. Um, but I specifically want to talk to Moxie today about her time in the Mennonite community, what she learned from that, and um, how she left. So Moxie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You make me sound very glamorous. <laughs> So Moxie, can you just start, like, tell us your story. Tell us your life story. Um, that's a, that's a pretty broad request. Um, I guess I was born into a family, uh, a traditional Mennonite family. Uh, I was raised a little differently than maybe the average Mennonite girl, simply because my family was Amish until pretty much right before I was born. And so even though I was raised in a Mennonite community, um, my parents raised me around a, a mentality that very much was was still Amish and very much um, steeped in those values and and those ideals. Um, and so that that kind of made things complicated some when I was a kid because there was plenty of uh, there was plenty of opportunities that Mennonite girls tend to have, and I felt like I didn't have access to quite as many of those. Um, so yeah, I guess those, um, those be exactly. Uh, the main one was education. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I can't see my eyeballs in this recording, and it's kind of it's kind of creeping myself out here. Is this better? <laughs> there you go. Um, the main one that I can think of uh, just immediately is is education, um, and even things like the freedom to you know get your driver's license at a certain age and do certain things at certain ages um the one that affected me the most deeply was education um i have four brothers and they were all permitted to attend a high school our church school had a high school but my parents wouldn't permit me to attend um i yeah. as much a 13 year old can want something i really wanted education i begged and pleaded and cried and did everything that I could think of to try to convince them to allow me to attend school. And every time I begged, they would laugh and they would say, you're a girl. What would you do with an education? Um, and so, you know, by the time I had it in me to leave and even long after I really believed that I wasn't worth an education because of the response to my request of the education that everyone was getting. So like all my girlfriends, oh no, I have an incoming call. They can, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is disappearing a lot. Let me put this to voicemail really quickly. If you don't mind, there we go. Yeah, no, uh, so like all of my girlfriends were going high school and I was the only one who wasn't given that option and I believed for a very long time that I wasn't worth an education just because of the response to my request of an education now, um, was that specific to your parents or to the Mennonite community that you couldn't no that was that was very individual to my parents because the the thinking that women don't need to be educated it's it's very much um when i say the plain communities that encompasses all anabaptists amish mennonites and everything in between um but in the plain communities it's really not that uncommon for people to think that women don't need education but it's a lot more um stringent and a lot more strongly believed in the amish communities and so that was a thing that was really just specific to my parents everyone else that i was around thought that girls should be allowed to go to high school or receive an education mm -hmm. but my parents because they were Amish until right before I was born really believed that I shouldn't be educated and you know they would say what would you do with an education don't tell me you need high school <clears throat> to be able to have children and bake cookies and wash dishes and you know be a 
a housewife. <clears throat> um, and that point, it was incredibly frustrating for me to hear because I, I mean, 13 is a pretty young age anyway to be hearing, you know, those types of responses to a request just for knowledge and education and teaching. Um, they did tell me that I could, you know, take high school at home. So it wasn't like I was totally devoid of the opportunity. Um, but there was no, um, there was, there were very few resources for me to do that. I could have gotten the books and ordered them. Um, but I didn't have, I did not have confidence enough to trust that I'd be able to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And if you have, if you have just been told that girls don't need an education, and if it has been implied that you're not worth an education, where's the motivation going to come from to actually pursue that on your own? Yeah. And that, that I think that that was a huge thing that affected me. Um, and got like, that was a big thing that had me believing things that were really not true about myself. And, um, things that I see myself still having to work on today to unlearn um, as far as what I'm capable of, what I do deserve, what I don't deserve, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's, um, that was, that was a big thing when I was growing up, but it's. um, What other things did you find really soul crushing when you were there? Like what things could you, um, because I know there's good experiences and there's hard. So what, what other hard experiences would you say being there? The other hard thing for me was um, my parents were more controlling than average, I would say. Um, and it's tricky to talk about this now. I'm learning how to speak truth about what did happen and um, maintain what I have now. Because the reality is um, at the time things were awful. I wanted to die. I thought my life was pretty close to being over. And now years later, I have a pretty good relationship with my parents. And so it's, um, I guess I'm still processing, <clears throat> you know, the events of everything leading up to what we have today. But at the time they were very controlling. Um, and one of the things that I remember, <clears throat> like it was yesterday, um, because I was not permitted to attend high school, I got out of school at 13 and I was just, kind of an adult right away there was no like teen years me hanging out with my friends I got to see my friends on Sundays after church for about 15 minutes to half an hour if I got lucky and then it was frustrating because they were all either in the youth group or then in school and I was in neither and I was just hmm. belong it felt like I belonged nowhere you know now I know that's not the case but you know things don't always feel like reality and that was definitely the case then and at the time you know I got out of school at 13 and I started working immediately as an adult and um something that's very common in Amish and Mennonite families is for kids not to be allowed to keep their own money mm -hmm. and every family is different <clears throat> some people might keep all of their kids money and then give it all back to them when they turn you know 18 or 21 more often 21 than 18 or they'll keep half of their money and, you know, buy certain necessities for them. And in my family, it was a little more strict. Um, my parents pocketed 90% of what I made. Um, and, you know, I'd go to town as a 15 or a 17 year old, make a hundred bucks, come home, give my mom the check and she would give me a $10 bill out of her purse. And I, this is something we disagree on to this day. They very much believe that that is what parents should be doing. They're very, um, they're very attached to their way of life still. Um, they're still Mennonite. I'm obviously not. Um, and it, it, I, that felt really demoralizing. So I got out of school at 13. I start working a lot, not quite full time, but a lot, especially for a 13 year old. And there was no like, people look on their, it seems to me that other people tend to look on their teen years with memories of, you know, a lot of social time, hanging out with their friends and doing this and doing that. And I just, I simply didn't have that. I was at home or I was at work or I was at church. One of those and not a whole lot of other things. Um, and even though I worked 
from the time that I was 13, for some reason, my parents didn't let me get my driver's license until I was almost 19 years old. Hmm. So what is that? Like six years of working as an adult and being infantilized and, and being treated as a child, even though you're making really good money and most of it is just going, you know, into your parents' bank account. And that was incredibly frustrating for me. And it was very difficult to deal with because, you know, you turn 18 years old and, you know, all my friends are getting out of high school. They're talking about their first job interviews or their first jobs. And I've been working for half a decade, but don't have the freedom to, you know, go get a snack in town or do, you know, go out with girlfriends or, you know, have an adult life. So I'm working like an adult. Um, being being treated as if I was a kid that um, shouldn't be trusted with little to no who is of little to no consequence um, and that was really hard to navigate because you know I I was working as an adult but being so infantilized mm-hmm. being treated like a child and all of my friends you know 15 16 17 18 oh me and so and so are going to go to town we're going to go get ice cream you know and there I am just sitting at home with like no option to go do those things. Um, and that was, it was just maddening. Hmm. It Like I it just, it just made me so angry because I was just kept at home and nobody could give me a good reason for it. And I was working like an adult, but I wasn't being treated like one. And it just, it was so incredibly stifling. Like I just, I wanted to die. And You know, I, I'm only now beginning to have these kinds of conversations with my parents about things that happened back then. And there's this huge difference between, you know, their view of raising a daughter. They really didn't know how to treat versus me being the daughter that felt so, uh, so controlled. Because see, all of my brothers, yes, they also work from a very young age, but, you know, pretty much as soon as they could, they'd got their licenses and, you know, they had a life. Um, and I just, I felt like I didn't have one. Why do you think your parents made the distinction between the boy and girl? Was that from the more Amish upbringing they had had or? I really believe that was it. I don't think, I don't think that they loved me any less than my brothers. I don't believe that for a second. And I don't think that they were playing favorites. I think that they just thought because I was a girl, I had to be more controlled and more told what to do and that I couldn't, you know, or I shouldn't think for myself as much or be as independent because, you know, in that world, as a woman, you're taught to completely depend on everybody else for everything. Now, specifically Amish or Mennonite? Uh, Both, but more Amish. I mean, both of them have those tendencies, but the Amish tendencies in that particular regard are much stronger. Okay. So, and then what kind of work were you doing? Were you just doing odd jobs for people in the town or? Uh, Mostly, I started out as a dishwasher at the local deli that was owned by one of the people in church. Uh, Soon after that, I got into cleaning jobs. I did a lot of different stuff. I did babysitting. Um, I fell into elderly care, which has kind of followed me until this day. Um, I've never really hunted it down. People just kind of fall in my lap. Please take care of grandma, you know, and the first patient I had was 106 years old and I was only 18. Um, To this day, she was my best patient. We were best of friends. She was born in 1910 and she had some of the best stories, but that was more at that particular time in my life. That was more the exception than the rule. The most of my, most of my time that I worked was spent professional housekeeping and house cleaning. Um, And my mother and I did this together. Um, and as much as we disagreed on things, we we were very close. We worked to get together for seven years before I left, just her and myself. And we made a really good reputation. You know, we were earning almost twice as much it was wow. than what average people in the same town were making for just the average job. And we we made ourselves we we made a reputation as kind of the most thorough and the most fast or I'm sorry, that was incorrect. The fastest and the most thorough. See, if you get a good house cleaner, you know, they can be really thorough, but then they tend to be slow. Or if they're fast, they tend to miss a lot of stuff. And we had a good enough reputation. Most of the time we could just pick and choose whatever jobs we wanted. And the most wealthy people in town 
knew us and had our numbers. Um, and so it's interesting. I, I didn't consider this until recently, but um, we didn't have much when we were growing up. Hmm. Like I want to say when I was a teenager, probably 80 to 90% of what I ate was something I raised or grew or hunted myself. You know, I was butchering chickens at 13. I was, you know, hunting deer, you know, at the, a little older than that, maybe like 15 or 16. And, and I knew how to process them. And, and that's what we ate. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I just spaced out. Oh, no, we talking? Well, actually, I was going to, I wanted to go back a second because you mentioned that you really we're close to your mom but at the same time you're frustrated with this dynamic of not being able to do all the things your friends are doing or your brothers are doing so how what aspects of your mom were you super close to her and how did that work out as you just have this I mean it's just an incredible tension for such a long period of time yeah I just now remembered what I was going to say I did want to say to your viewers I I do have an excuse for this I had a traumatic brain injury four years ago and sometimes I space out in the middle of sentences so bear with me. Um, with my mom, we're very much the same. We have the same sense of humor. We have the same type of cynicism about us. Um, we enjoy the same things. We think the same way. We express ourselves the same way. I can't tell you how many years it was that I lived at home. I would come down the stairs in the morning and look at her and she'd be wearing the same dress as me or like the same color dress, same fabric. And we did not plan it. We just think the same way. Or she'd be wearing, you know, uh, like a blue dress with a white sweater and I'd be wearing like a white dress with a blue sweater. And it, it happened very consistently. We think very much the same, um, but she's very, um, she's extremely attached to the belief system that she was taught to embrace. She, traditionalism and legalism and believing pretty much most of what the church tells you to believe and you know down to very minute details that is her safety so what do and you can say the differences as well what was your church experience like what are the differences you would have experienced the Mennonite side of the church but yet your parents influenced by the Amish may also have brought that in so how did that play into your religious experience um I'm not sure I understand the question you're asking just in general what my religious experience was within the church. Mm -hmm. um, mine was different than you ask anybody that was ever a teenage girl in the Mennonite church and they will give you a different answer than any male ever. Um, teen women and girls are very infantilized. You're taught what to believe, what to dress, how to eat, how to walk how to talk, how to laugh, how to comb your hair. Very, very minute details that you are told how to handle yourself mm -hmm. and what to say and how to act. And um, yes, men are controlled, but not nearly to that degree. And so like my mom really adhered to that. Like that was, that was the be all end all for her. And I, I want to know why I, if, if I do something, I have a reason for it. And women are infantilized and teenage girls are incredibly scrutinized in the church. I mean, the color of thread that you sew your dress with will be noticed. How deep the, how, how, um, how deep the hems are sewn on your dress will be noticed. Um, exactly what you do to the sleeves when you make your dress will be noticed. The color of socks you wear on Sunday, exactly mm -hmm. the style, the height, the, the type of fabric used to make the shoes that you have bought will be noticed. Did you Who have an experience like that that you can recount at the, ch at the church? Um, I remember... Um, I, I was a rule follower, even though I was a question asker and was hated for it. I was a rule follower. I was afraid of what people thought. And I was so intent on following the rules. I didn't get into trouble much as far as my clothes go, because I knew how to follow the rules and I followed them well. Hmm. Um, people would get angry with me for asking questions they couldn't answer. It would make them very angry, particularly the ministers 
Um, Because you're not supposed to ask questions. And especially not if you are a teenage girl. Do not ask questions. Ever. And so, you know, I didn't really get into trouble for my clothes. But I do remember uh, I went to this one Bible school in Arkansas that was extremely strict. It was created uh, just for the type of denomination uh, that I was. And here's... um. Just for context, let me explain this to you and your viewers. There could be two Mennonite women standing in front of you. To you, they would look exactly the same. I could look at them and say, oh, this lady, the strings on her head covering are a quarter inch wide. And this lady's head covering strings are, um, you know, an eighth of an inch wide. And her socks are white and her socks are brown. This lady has a belt on her dress. And this lady's belt is, you know, this wide, or this lady's wearing elastic in her dress, and this lady isn't. And things that minute will separate entire denominations of churches within the Mennonite and Amish communities. And those things are a big deal, a really big deal to them. And um, because of that, be, when you are so, when your world is so controlled, your world is very small, and in details that the rest of the world wouldn't even understand exist. Um, are a very, very big deal to them. And so I went to this Bible school that was created for the particular denomination of church that I was at. It was a winter Bible school, maybe three or four weeks long. And um, I remember one of the women deans getting after me because um, you, when you were in class or seen anywhere outside of the girls' dorm, the sleeves on your dress had, you weren't allowed to see your elbows because it was considered immodest. And I took, um, I had some short sleeved work dresses that I really wanted to take along. And so I just covered them up with a sweater that was not see-through and you couldn't see that the dress sleeves ended here and my sweater sleeves ended here. And the Dean found out about this and she's like, you really shouldn't be doing that. And I was like, no one is going to see my elbow outside of this dorm. Like, calm yourself, lady. <laughs> and, you know, so it was, it was extremely controlled. Um, and, and if you ask religious questions in church, what's that? Like ask spiritual questions in church. What was that like? If you had a question about like, for instance, was scripture read? And then if you had questions, could you say anything or was no scripture read or how did that work in relation to like learning about scripture? So scripture was read plenty. Uh, as a woman, you knew better than to voice any of that in church. You remember what you want to ask. And later, when a lot of people can't see you, you ask the person about it. If, if you're curious about what that particular person who spoke, usually men, because women don't ever speak in church, you, you can't even ask questions or anything like that. And so if you're going to ask a question, it has to be in a very specific setting, typically after church when there's plenty of people around and you can ask that particular question then. Um, but if if you ask a question that hasn't been asked a lot before or if they're not sure to answer, um, they become very uncomfortable because in their minds, if they don't know the answer to every single question, um, they're just not okay with themselves. Like you, in, in their minds, you have to know the answer to every single question because if you don't, are you really a real Christian? Hmm. And it's a very twisted way of thinking to think that there's an answer to every question. Like not every question has to be answered for us to live with ourselves, but they, they don't think that way. They don't believe that. And so if you ask a genuine question that uh, that they can't answer, you will either get a really canned cliche answer that means absolutely nothing, or if they're feeling really insecure about themselves, you're kind of chastised and told like it's not your place to understand or know or ask any of those things because you're a woman. Was there anything particularly when you were growing up that you didn't understand that you wanted to, but were too afraid to ask about? Uh. I don't know that I was too afraid to ask about it. I was just frustrated about it because it didn't make any sense to me. One of the things that I grew up with uh, was there was this very strict rule of no music. We did not have a piano in the church house or an organ or anything. I truly grew up in a world without music. 
um, we had a great musical education, but it was only vocals. So we sang a lot and we sang well. And I don't, I'm convinced to this day that uh, you will not hear singing like it anywhere else in the world. You know, I know there's plenty of choirs and, um, you know, chamber choirs and choral symphonies, and there's all kinds of people that sing. You know, I know a lot of like Brigham Young University people really like their music, stuff like that, as far as a cappella singing. And in my mind, it's just, it does not equate. Because when you grow up being taught to sing without ever having the opportunity to make an instrument accompany you and make your voice sound better or cover up flaws, you get really good at it when it's a thing that's part of your life a lot. And I knew from the time that I was four years old that I wanted to play the fiddle. And I knew better than to ask, even at that young age, because music was worldly and it would surely lead us astray and then we would sin. And, you know, by that equation, music is basically from the devil. <laughs> and ironically enough, it was such a big deal when I was a kid. And now years later, that very same church has allowed music. Um so I don't know why it was such a big deal, but it was aggravating to me because there are many accounts in the Bible where music was used um, as an act of praise and worship. And yet they were sitting there giving me very canned answers on why we couldn't have music. But I knew better, like in my mind, it wasn't even worth asking them why, because if you're a teenage girl, nothing is yours. Nothing you say is going to change the fact that you're not going to be able to be allowed to play music. You know, I knew better than to ask. It wasn't worth my time. I could have sat there and asked them until I was blue in the face and it would have been like talking to a brick wall. And so there's just a lot of things like that that didn't make sense that you learn to just accept as reality because you know your voice is not going to make one iota of difference except the only difference it would make is that it would make you be scrutinized even more harshly mm -hmm. and people, especially leaders, would would um, shut you down even more in the future. So you had to choose very carefully what it was you wanted to talk about, because if you talked about something that you knew they wouldn't like or that was definitely not approved, you know, that's going to squelch your chances of like having any credit with them in the future of being listened to. And if it was something that you really cared about. When. Was there, um, were you allowed to read the Bible? Like, did you have a Bible of your own? Oh, yeah. So it was very evangelical Christian. Um, uh, memorizing the Bible or parts of the Bible was a huge part of the school curriculum. I think by the time I graduated eighth grade, I knew pretty much all of Ephesians word for word. I could, I could recite it perfectly. Hmm. Um, several chapters in Hebrews. I think I also knew the book of James, a lot of the Psalms, Genesis 1, several chapters in Exodus. Like you knew a lot. And what I knew wasn't even that impressive compared to other schools that I knew about. Like I knew people that would have, by the time they graduated high school, would have, you know, at least four to five books of the New Testament completely memorized and they could recite it mm -hmm. word for word perfectly. And so, you know, we had constant access to the Bible. It was a huge part of our school curriculum. It was part of daily family life for a lot of people growing up in that. Um, but it meant something completely different than it did, I suspect, to what I would say are people that are really genuine about it. It was, it was a very legalistic thing, and it was very cherry-picked. Um, a huge part of that whole religion is based around women covering their heads. I know a lot of people think it's not a big deal either way, but I really think that if you took that away, a huge part of the basis and the structure of re that religion would just crumble. Speaking about Mennonite or Amish or both? Both. Both. All of the plain communities. Like, you can you can do you can sin all of these little sins and it's like a slap on the wrist but if you take your head covering off you will get excommunicated in a second and um i i really think that it has a lot to do with the oppression of women that are in that culture and the, the brainwashing women infantilizing women i know those are strong words but after having to unlearn what i have unlearned 
I say those things actually meaning them. Um, and so like, you know, the, you have constant access to the Bible, but there's so many little verses that are just cherry picked and completely taken out of context to support a huge basis of that religion. And, and in a couple of, you know, instances, suddenly it's not even about your beliefs in the Bible anymore. It's about controlling all of our people to be a little cookie cutter shaped society where we're all the same. We all have the same dress pattern. We all have exactly the same fabric of head covering. It's covering exactly the same amount of hair on every woman. And, you know, I, I don't think we were created to be cookie cutter people. You know, you can't do much that way. You can't, you can't be very effective in the world as an individual or as a people group if you're exactly the same. What for you then? I mean, I would guess you probably didn't want, and we've talked about this a little bit too. Like you didn't, I'm guessing you didn't want a real relationship because it just with the Lord at all, because it seemed like God was, as he's presented, he's a pretty controlled. Um, I did, but it was very much based out of fear. It, it, you want a relationship with God, but just for the sole fact that you don't go to hell. Okay. That's the only That's the only reason that you have to want a relationship with God, because people are like, oh, God is like the bishop or like your dad or like your uncle or, you know, he's a really good person. I'm like, people, if God is like the bishop and my dad and my uncle and this person and that person, I want nothing to do with him. You know, mm -hmm. if. If God is like the men in my life that I know that think that their only role in my life is to control me, to tell me what to do, instead of actually letting me be a person, no, thank you. Right. You know, I'll something else, you know, um, and I, I felt very strongly about that. Um, and yeah, I did want a relationship with God, but just so I wouldn't go to hell. What does that look like as you're doing that now? Because I know... It sounds like, I mean, there's a lot of trauma associated with that. So how are you, yeah. how, well, like, not, even, how would you say for those who are struggling with religion, trauma, and working through that, how are you doing that right now? Um, I think it's going to look different for every person. I don't think there's any blueprint that you can just look up and say, here's how to deal with religious and spiritual abuse. Because there was, you know, I dealt with a lot of emotional and spiritual and church abuse, and there was a lot of trauma. Um, and you know, Danielle, I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the lucky ones. I think, I think I'm one of the few that got out without ever being sexually assaulted. And a lot of that happens in weird kind of churchy contexts. And, you know, we know about the Catholic scandal and the this scandal and the that scandal, but people don't know how rampant it is in the plain communities just because the women don't have access to the outside world. At, you know, if you don't leave when you're at a young age, like I did, if you've got kids, you're not going to leave. You yeah. don't have a way. And so um, it looks different for me. I think that I got really lucky getting out when I did. I know I got really lucky getting out when I did. Um I was pretty agnostic for a while. I never truly believed that God didn't exist, but I went through, and actually I was kind of in this state of mind when I met you and you were probably able to recognize that. But, you know, if God did exist, where was he at all this time? And why, if he did exist, are there churches that exist claiming, proclaiming every day do or die that they're the real deal and that they're the ones representing god when actually it's really evil and twisted and ugly the things that they are doing mm -hmm. and i came to a point after leaving where i realized that if i didn't let myself question what i had never questioned before is god real then what i did believe was never going to be that genuine mm -hmm. And I ended up at this job. I was the caretaker of a historical estate in the middle of nowhere, at least for Northern Virginia. Now I'm truly in the middle of nowhere, but for back East, it was the middle of nowhere. And it was the beginning of COVID. Um, and suddenly I was living in a cabin on top of a mountain all by myself. And I didn't see anybody for days. And I was truly by myself. 
And when you live in a world like that, where you have so little physical contact with other humans, it really warps your perception of space and reality and, and things around you. And I had experienced that before, but in, in a little bit of a different context. And that was the first time in my life where I said, I don't even know. I don't even know what I believe. You know, none of this going to bed, repenting for whatever I had done that day or being super critical of myself. I was simply too exhausted to keep pretending and trying to convince myself what everyone had always told me that I must believe. Mm. I was at the end of my rope and I said, you know what? I don't know if he's real or not. I, I don't know if I'll ever know. And I had to make peace with that because I knew if I didn't let myself be in that uncomfortable space of not knowing then I was never going to be that real I nothing was ever going to be that genuine as far as what I did believe hmm. and I was in northern Virginia um I I met this couple I now I call them my DC parents or my northern Virginia parents I met this couple they came up the mountain to take a hike and I talked to them for five minutes and I really connected with them deeply very quickly I, mean, I exchanged numbers with the wife and a couple of days later she messaged me and she said hey why don't you come to my house for dinner and I had never been that close to Washington DC before I grew up on a farm the thought of going that far east that close to DC knowing nobody in northern Virginia was terrifying to me um, you know, I was carrying self-protection concealed and I was like telling someone, this is where I'm going to be at this time. Like, <laughs> come look for me if I don't show up. I don't know if these people are going to stuff me in a closet or what, you know, <laughs> you just don't know, like as a solo female in a new place where you don't know anyone, truly, you don't know what you don't know. So I was pretty scared. Right. But I was like, whatever, these people seem nice. I'm going to have to get to know someone in this area in some form or fashion. So here we go. So I drive to their house and it's like a 40 minute drive, which at the time seemed exorbitant. Now I'm driving like three hours to get milk and eggs, you know, and get mail once or twice a month if I'm lucky. But at the time it seemed like a really long way to drive. And I get there, they're super nice. I start telling them my story and they're like, you walked the Appalachian trail? Like, well, and anyway, it was like, they were amazed, right? And I noticed the two of them kind of messaging back and forth at the dinner table. And I just thought to myself, how rude, you know, like if you got something to say, say it. Otherwise go in the other room. Like this is bullshit. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And pretty soon they do go in the other room and I'm by myself in their dining room. And I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> I'm like, this is so, like, I don't know what these people's problem is, but I think they've got one, you know, and I'm, like, starting to judge them in my mind, and I'm just like, this is really weird, and they kind of come back in the dining room, and, you know, we're making small talk, pretending like nothing had happened, and they kind of look back and forth at each other, and he, the husband goes, uh, Moxie, Four different times in the conversation that I've had with you, I have felt the Lord tell me that I need to give you money. I don't know if you're in trouble. I don't know what's happening with you. Um, but at this point, it would be disobeying God if I did not do this. They sat down and wrote me a check. And it was about half a year's wages for me. It was a large amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I was up to my I was up to my eyeballs in medical debt from my brain injury at the time. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was very anxious about it. And they give me this check and they said, we want you to know that there, this is no strings attached. There are no requirements. If you want to leave and never talk to us again, that is fine. We won't be offended, but God told us to do this thing. We're doing this thing. And you do not owe us anything. You don't have to feel bad. This is no longer our money. We're just doing what God told us to do. These are strangers. I had seen them once before for about eight minutes. And of course I start crying and I'm in a really fragile place at the time. Anyway, I think I was only 
think I was less than a year post brain injury and I was less than two years on my own. And I was still in a really fragile place of just trying to make it on my own in a world that is not kind to brainwashed individuals. And on my way home, I experienced one of the most beautiful sunsets of my life. And I start talking to God. And to this day, I can't do churchy prayers. I, I, I trigger myself. There's enough trauma in my past with church and prayers and religious stuff. You know, I still tend to swear some, actually quite a bit in my prayers. I don't have the time and the energy, and it doesn't feel safe to pray prayers like I was taught to pray. Right. And so I start talking to God on the way home and I'm like, I don't know what the deal is. Like, I didn't even know if you were there, like basically what the heck, you know, what is this about? And as clear as day, not in an audible voice, but I heard God telling me that he understands why I am traumatized, that he is not angry at me for being traumatized. And that he wants to be close to me and it doesn't matter how long it will take. That he's not in a hurry. Like that there's no timeline attached to it for me. That I can run away as many times as I need and I can take time away as many times as I need. And he's not going to get angry with me for needing space to survive being traumatized by the thought of a relationship with him. And... That experience is really has set the trajectory of my growing belief system ever since then. Um, That and one or two other pretty supernatural experiences have really shaped my belief system. Um, I still don't go to church. I have not been able to attend church without a panic attack. I'm watching for the preacher, figuring out who I'm going to have to protect myself from, making sure I know where all the exit doors are the second I walk in, and um, haven't been able to do it. And I'm okay with that. Um, But I do have a belief system, and I do believe. um, But everything that I believe and the ways that I believe are very different from anything I've ever been told that it should look like. Um, And like I said, I, I can't do the, like, God, I come before you tonight. No, I just can't. I cannot talk like that and feel safe in my own body. And, you know, so my prayers are pretty raw and real. And I, like I said, I swear quite a bit. What, um, what do you think you believe now about God? Um, about what kind of being he is or like the nature of God? Yeah. I mean, for instance, like Christianity, we're going to say, right, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, believe in him, you go to heaven. But it sounds like with the Mennonite community, I don't even, it seems very works oriented in general. So I don't know if that aspect of grace was even present. Is that something that you're even exploring now? Because it seems like just very different in the sense of works, works, works. To the yeah. point where, I mean, you're just frazzled out of your mind. Um, the, the conflicting thing when you're a kid is that you're told that it's not works and you're told about grace, but you've never seen grace lived out in your life. You've never seen a speck of grace in your life. You know, you've never seen it, but you've told it exists. You, you're told all your life it exists. You're told that works and grace go hand in hand. It's not by works, but it's also not just by like you're told that it's about a 50 50 balance, but you're really not seeing any kind of balance. All you're seeing is works. So now. What do you think about that? Is that like is salvation even an area you can go to yet? as you've been working through this, because as you said, this is a long journey for you. And this yeah, is- I don't, you know, I imagine maybe in a couple of years from now, I'll have an opinion on that. Like, I like, I do believe in the Bible, like I believe in the creation story. Um, as far as salvation, like, I think that it happened, but I don't, honestly, I don't really know. Like, I don't have a problem with the idea of it. And I'm not here to to argue with anyone who does believe it. Um, But as far as how real it is to me, honestly, I don't really know. Uh, Like, like I feel 
I feel like I've started from ground zero and I feel like I'm not in a hurry to conjure up any beliefs that aren't there yet. Yeah. Um, and so that's not, not really an area that I have explored. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I don't have a problem with the idea of it, but it's not something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, because there's, there's so much of that, what there's so much of that kind of thing where even something as simple as opening the Bible and reading a passage, we were so familiar with so much of the Bible. Yeah. I can count maybe two or three times in my life that I've been able to open the Bible and read it without getting some form of flashback or anxiety or hearing a preacher's voice in my head trying to make that portion of scripture say whatever he wants it to say personally so that he can control people. Right. Um, and so there's so much of that that is just so wrapped up in so many memories um, that haven't really even been processed for me yet. And it's like, you know, I'm five years later, you know, almost six. Um, so it's not been that long for me. And yeah. so I think that's just one of those unexplored areas. What do you think, just as a last question for you to wrap up our time, What, how would you encourage um anyone i mean it could be somebody who's in the mennonite or the plains community in general um or just anyone even who's recently come out of that how would you encourage them as they're maybe questioning challenging thinking about what to do how to how to live or even especially for women like how to be a woman and they're not even really sure um, you know, I think one of the biggest reasons that I've been able to make any kind of progress and experience any kind of healing, um, yes, I've done a lot of work on my own. I really have. But the reality is I wouldn't be here if it wouldn't be for the people that have helped me out. And I would encourage anyone coming out of something like that to find safe people to surround yourself with. And if you're not sure if someone is safe or not, ask if yourself if you think they have anything to gain by helping you. If they can gain no personal, if they have no personal gain to acquire from helping you or doing X, Y, or Z for you, it's probably the real deal. Like they're probably genuine people. Because I, I got taken advantage of a lot when I left just because I was so sheltered and so naive. And you know, so many times I had to start completely over because I would think someone wanted to help me. And then because of them, I would lose just about everything. Um, and that happened a lot of times. And, you know, the people that I, that I really consider family now, in addition to my real biological family, you know, they're the people that did not have anything to gain by helping me. They didn't try to make me into someone I wasn't. They didn't tell me what to believe. They didn't tell me what decisions I should be making. They just invited me into their lives and said, we're doing life. You can do it with us. They didn't treat me special. They didn't treat me like a guest. They just understood and recognized the fact that I needed to be around healthy, safe people. And they were that for me. And I just, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. Well, Moxie, I want to thank you so much. Again, people who are listening, this is Deb Beachy. Um, she left the Mennonite community several years ago. And is since, I mean, right now she's in Mexico. Um, New Mexico. New Mexico, thank you. New Mexico and making- Hello, Mexico. United States citizen, ma'am. I haven't gone yeah. that far. <laughs> New Mexico, and she's making a life for herself and just really trying to figure out her purpose and- she meets tons of people, but I'd highly encourage too, if any of you are interested, she's very open about her life and open to questions and talking. So if any of you are interested in talking to her further, want to know more about her story, just reach out to me and I can pass it on to her. But Deb, thank you so much again for this time. And it's it's been encouraging to me and I really thank you for how raw and vulnerable you've been. You're welcome. I, I definitely uh processed a few things uh on the fly you you're, you're very good at asking uh, questions that haven't been asked before so uh thank you for having me